you for inviting me back to speak at this church. I think this is the fourth time I've, I've been here over the past 30 years. So, uh, um, and I'm coming here with three different uh, messages this morning. There'll be a fourth one tonight. All of them are different, and all of them are at a different intellectual level. And I was told by your pastors that this is the most intelligent of the congregations. <laughs> so. This first talk will be at a significantly higher intellectual level than the succeeding talks, but I, I've been told you're really up for this. So, uh, but you, you know, Reasons to Believe is an organization I founded, and all of you should have gotten one of these cards as you walked in. And actually what this card does is give you on one little piece a summary of what you're going to be hearing throughout the various talks this morning. So that's just a little something that you can take with you and uh, feel free to share that with someone. But there's also a little tear off there where you can put uh, your name and some information. And if you hand that in at the book table at the back, they will give you this DVD, Cosmic Fingerprints, for free. Uh, it's basically a story of how cosmology brought me to faith in Christ eight years before I met a Christian. But we also show you uh, um, a bit about where I field questions from skeptics. So that's, that's a free gift, and uh, we have found this to be a very effective giveaway for your non-Christian friends, just to kind of get them exposed to the Christian faith and get them thinking about uh, how they can have a relationship with Christ as well. So that's at the back. And uh, this first talk is called Cosmic Reasons to Believe. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm an astronomer. I'm also a pastor, by the way. So what I'm going to be doing this morning is showing you how the two books integrate, the book of nature and the book of scripture, God's two books of revelation. But the reason why I'm focusing on the astronomy is it's the one scientific discipline where we directly observe the past. Now in astronomy, all of our data takes time to reach our telescope uh, because of the velocity of light. So when we look at the sun, we don't see it as it is now, we see it as it was eight minutes ago. And I tell my wife that because I'm an astronomer, I cannot be held accountable for the present. All of my data comes from the past. Uh, but because of that, we now are able to literally watch the universe being created. And because of this direct access to the past and our ability to see what God did in creation, this is where we get our most compelling scientific evidence uh, for the God of the Bible. Now, the most common complaint I hear when I'm speaking on a secular university campus is creation is not science because it can't be put to the test. Well, in astronomy, we can put it to the test. And what we've been doing since the very beginning of Reasons to Believe is to operate on the campus with a biblical creation model that is testable, that is falsifiable, and makes predictions of future scientific discoveries. You know, rather than attacking the evolutionary paradigms, we present a positive case for creation. Because when they can share with you, the evolutionists will not abandon their models, no matter how many flaws you point out, until they see a better model to take its place. So it's crucial we present them with that model and show them how it can be tested and how it makes predictions. Now, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking this debate is about design. If you read the scientific literature, everyone concedes that there is design. You see it in all the scientific papers. Paul Davies, an, eighth, an agnostic astronomer, said the impression of design is overwhelming. The real debate is who or what is responsible for this pervasive design we see throughout the record of nature. And where we differ from the intelligent design movement, we actually identify who is responsible for the design. So my mission this morning is, is the scientific evidence for the Creator's intervention in designing everything for the benefit of us human beings shrinking or growing as we learn more and more about the book of nature? And is that evidence now sufficient that we can eliminate some or all the alternate explanations? My goal this morning is not only to establish that there is a God, but that it's the God of the Bible as opposed to the God of Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, etc. Now, I'll be telling you a little bit about my story this evening, but I became passionately interested in astronomy starting at age seven. And the first book I read in cosmology was when I was seven. It was a book by Sir Fred Hoyle. 
the nature of the universe. And he comes from a Hindu worldview perspective. But this is what he said about the Bible. There's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. It is a remarkable conception. And you know, you'll hear my story this evening, but I've read through the different holy books of religions of the world. And when I picked up the Bible, I realized Hoyle was right. The Bible's got more than 10 times as much to say about the origin and history of the universe than all the rest of the holy books and religions of the world combined. And there's four themes that the Bible addresses over and over again concerning the universe. First of all, that the universe can be traced back to a singularity beginning. Now that's a physics term. It simply means that the universe can be traced back to an ultimate beginning of all matter, all energy, all space, and all time. And that the universe continuously expands from that space-time beginning. Expands under constant laws of physics, where one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. Now what I'm gonna do in the next few minutes is show you where the Bible makes these claims. And then I'll give you data from the book of nature that shows you that thousands of years ago, the Bible got it right. Now, most of you are probably familiar with at least a few of the passages in the Bible that speak about the beginning of the universe. I found no matter where I speak in the world, everybody seems to know Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I remember reading that at age 17 in the Bible, saying, I wonder what this heavens and earth is all about. There is no word universe in biblical Hebrew. They have this phrase, the Shamayan Ares, and when it's attached to the definite articles, it means the entirety of physical reality, all matter, all energy, all space and time. And the word create means to bring into existence something brand new that never existed before. The New Testament puts it this way in the book of Hebrews. The universe that we can detect did not come from that which we can detect. Well, we can detect matter, energy, space, and time. I don't have the passages here, but in Timothy and Titus, we got Paul talking about what God was doing before the beginning of time. The grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. The hope that we share in Jesus Christ was given to us before the beginning of time. Now, I was reading the Bible seriously for the first time in my life at the same era that physicists in Britain were developing the first of the space-time theorems. And I actually brought the first of those theorems with me. This is a paper uh, published in uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society of uh, London. I mean, you all got to get this paper. It's just incredible reading. I mean, the, the, the tensor calculus in here is just gorgeous. I mean, you got to get this thing. <laughs> so, but this is the paper that launched Stephen Hawking to worldwide fame singularities of gravitational collapse and cosmology. Now, if you go to the very last page, you have a statement that I think we can all understand. If mass exists, and all of you are living proof that mass exists, and if general relativity reliably describes the movements of bodies in the universe, this paper establishes that then space and time has a beginning. Space and time must be created which implies there must be some causal agent outside of space and time that creates our universe of matter, energy, space, and time. Now, right away, physicists and astronomers that had a non-theistic perspective recognized that this was a threat to the worldview. And two in particular, Arvind Borde and Alexander Vilenkin, devoted 10 years of their theoretical physics career to trying to find a loophole around this theorem where they wouldn't be stuck with a causal agent beyond space and time that creates everything. And during that 10-year period, they published four papers, culminating in this particular paper, inflationary space times are not past incomplete. Now, I don't know where they get these titles. Um, they certainly didn't work with our editorial department. Uh, but what they wound up doing in this fourth paper is coming up with a far more powerful space-time theorem that says the following. Any universe 
which means we're not having to worry about quantum gravity effects or inflationary effects near the beginning of the universe. Any universe that expands on average throughout its history must have a space-time beginning, implying a causal agent beyond space and time that creates space, time, matter, and energy. And he also uh, recruited Alan Guth, who is the inventor of the inflationary Big Bang model, to join them in bringing out this paper. Now, don't get me wrong, they did find models of the universe where they didn't need this causal agent, but every one of those models was a universe that would not permit the existence of physical life, which is why they added this statement, all reasonable expanding universe models, namely those models that would permit the existence of physical life, are subject to the relentless grip of the space-time theorems. Now this has several philosophical implications. Number one, no longer can scientists presume that all causes are natural. You know, a lot of scientists operate that way. We're not going to consider supernatural causes, only natural ones. Well, notice what these space-time theorems have done for us. It's shown beyond any shadow of doubt that there must be an agent beyond space and time that created matter, energy, space, and time. That's literally the most spectacular miracle than any scientist could ever hope to discover, the coming into existence of all physical reality. And the point is this, if that causal agent performed that dramatic of a miracle, then surely it's within his purview to intervene at points thereafter. Which means from now on, science must be open to the possibility that the causes they're investigating may be natural or supernatural. Or to put it another way, some kind of God must exist. Now, this is actually now conceded in the latest books being published by atheist physicists and astronomers. Probably the most famous atheist scientist in America today is Lawrence Krauss, a particle physicist at Arizona State University. He wrote a book a few months ago called A Universe from Nothing. But this is what he says on page 173. One cannot rule out such a deistic view of nature. There must be some agent beyond space and time that creates the universe and sets up all the math and physics. You know, a lot of believers don't recognize that the debate has shifted from whether or not God exists to whether or not God is a personal being. Because if you read Lawrence Krauss's book, he's adamant that this God is not a personal being simply an agent that creates the whole universe and sets up all the math and physics. But hey, that is the dictionary definition of the God of the Bible, so it's a remarkable concession. Which is why I think it's so important to look at what else the Bible says about the universe. Because what else it has to say establishes that this agent beyond space and time must be a personal being. The Bible actually says more about the expansion of the universe than it does the beginning of the universe. Now, the reason why that's overlooked in a lot of churches, you will not find it in Genesis. But you will find it in the oldest book of the Bible. Genesis is not the oldest book in the Bible. Uh, that credit goes to the book of Job. But in Job 9.8, we have Job saying, God alone expands the universe. Now again, a problem is most English translations will have the verb nata, the stretching out of the heavens. But the verb nata is actually better translated, the expansion of whatever is being described. And notice how many different Bible authors speak about this expansion of the universe. It's in Zechariah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, the psalmist, as well as Job that addresses the subject of the expansion of the universe. And I've actually debated Michael Shermer, the executive director of the Skeptic Society, on this issue. He insists that all these biblical passages are mere figures of speech, that they're not literally speaking about the expansion of the universe. But if you actually examine these passages, you'll see that the verb nata is in all three Hebrew verb forms. And therefore, it literally is declaring that we live in a continuously expanding universe. And incidentally, Jewish theologians living 800 years ago in studying the Old Testament drew the same conclusion. The reason why that was so disturbing to Michael Shermer, he realized if he conceded that the Bible was declaring that we live in a continuously expanding universe, 
That means the Bible stood alone for thousands of years as the only book of science, philosophy, or theology that made that claim about the universe. You don't find scientists speaking about that until the 20th century, which means thousands of years ago, six different Bible authors had correctly predicted a feature of the universe that we've only recently discovered to be true. Now, I've written an entire book, The Creator and the Cosmos, giving the evidence that we indeed live in a, an expanding universe. What I'm going to show you this morning is just simply a visual demonstration. And what you see here is, from the Hubble Space Telescope, a shot of a distant part of the universe where the galaxies are 12 billion light years away, which means we're seeing them as they were 12 billion years ago. Contrasted with another shot where we're looking at galaxies only 2 billion light years away. And I purposely put these two images to the same spatial scale. So you can see here how galaxies were jammed so tightly together, they're literally tearing spiral arms off one another. But as you move forward in time, the galaxies are stretched apart from one another to such a degree that that phenomena is now rarely observed. And if I had time, I could show you dozens of images over the whole history of the universe showing this expansion of the universe. And seven times in the Bible it tells us we live in a universe where the laws of physics don't change. Here's one example from Jeremiah 33. In fact, if you read the entire chapter, it's God saying to the Jews, you change, I do not change. As proof that I don't change, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. Well, you can see some articles on our reasons.org website where I give you the latest measurements that show that the laws of physics indeed have remained constant over the past 12 billion years to 17 places of the decimal. I mean, we actually have very uh, good confirmation that the Bible got it right. And then you can look at Ecclesiastes or Romans 8, and it talks about this pervasive law of decay. I mean, when Solomon is writing in uh, Ecclesiastes, he's saying everything is decaying. Uh, matter of fact, if you look around at your fellow uh, people there, all of you are evidence of ongoing decay. I mean, even the young ones here, you can see evidence of decay on their physical body. Everything is decaying. Or look at my garage, you can see decay, decay taking place there as well. The entire universe is subject to this law of decay. Now, I remember reading this when I was 17 years of age in the Bible and saying, okay, space-time beginning, continuous expansion from that space-time beginning under laws that don't change, and one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. Now, a lot of you came here by automobile. Your automobile works on the piston chamber uh, principle, where the piston chamber expands, the temperature goes down. The piston chamber compresses, the temperature goes up. That applies to the entire universe, which means the Bible is declaring we live in a universe that gets colder and colder as it gets older and older. And with the space-time beginning, with everything squished into that space-time um, infinitesimal volume, the universe starts off near infinitely hot. But it cools as it expands. And if you can measure the age of the universe, which we can now measure to four places of the decimal, we can actually come up with a cooling curve from the, uh, of the universe based on what the Bible declares. And that black curve there is your biblically predicted cooling curve for the universe, given that we know the age of the universe. And what you see here are 13 actual measurements we astronomers have made of the past temperature of the universe. The latest one just published last year is this one right here. The error bar is so tiny, it's smaller than the thick thickness of the line, and it perfectly matches the line, showing that indeed the Bible got it right. I say this because I was debating uh, quantum physicists at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he says, I want to see the Bible making a prediction that I can test by actual measurements. Well, here's one such example. Now, today, we know what's most responsible for the expansion of the universe. It's something called dark energy, which was only discovered in 1999. But now we know that dark energy makes up about three quarters of all the stuff of the universe. 
It's the energy embedded in the space surface of the universe. And the way that energy works is as the surface of the universe expands, dark energy becomes progressively more and more powerful in its capacity to accelerate the expansion of the universe. And that determines what kind of stuff will form in the universe. So for example, if dark energy were more powerful uh, than what we measure, that means that the universe would be expanding so rapidly that gravity would never be able to collect gas and dust to make galaxies, stars, and planets. Now, if you live in a universe that's nothing but dispersed gas, then there's no place for life to live. Life is impossible. But if you make that dark energy a little weaker than what we measure, then what happens is gravity will collect all that gas and quickly compress it into nothing but black holes and neutron stars. Now, black holes and neutron stars have a minimum density of two billion tons per level teaspoonful. I saw some of you with coffee. Can you imagine taking a teaspoonful, plunk, two billion tons? All right. The density is so extreme that molecules can't exist. Atoms can't exist. Not even protons and electrons can exist. And of course, life would be impossible. Now, what was, astound what was astounding to astronomers it was to discover the degree to which you have to fine-tune design dark energy in order to get planets and stars. You literally have to fine-tune it to a degree that's 10 to the 97 times superior to the very best example of human engineering, creativity, and design. If you want to know what that is, it's a gravity wave telescope. It was invented by Caltech and MIT physicists. They designed it. And thanks to the US government, it got funded. Well, what this measure tells us is that the one that created space and time and designed this dark energy is at a minimum of 10 trillion 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 times more intelligent and more knowledgeable than those Caltech and MIT physicists. <laughs> now, I was on the faculty of Caltech for five years. These gentlemen are very educated and very intelligent. But the creator of the universe is that many times more intelligent and more knowledgeable. Or I could put it another way. The creator of the universe is that many times better funded than the US government <laughs> that made this amazing instrument possible. I think you can get my point. This agent beyond space and time must be a personal being because only a personal being can manifest the attributes of intellect, knowledge, creativity, and power. And does so so many times better than us human beings, it eliminates the possibility that it's the god of Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam. This is the god of the Bible. Now, I'm telling you this as an astrophysicist who is an evangelical Christian. But I'll tell you this, even the atheist theoretical physicists recognize the theological implications. In fact, there are three of them that wrote this paper, Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant. And what I'm going to do is pull for you three quotes from these three theoretical uh, physicists, all of them atheists. And uh, they were interviewed by the senior physics editor of Nature, our world's most premier uh, science uh, journal. And this is what they said in the interview. Arranging the universe as we think it is arranged, says the team, would have required a miracle. Statement number two. An unknown agent beyond space and time intervened in the evolution of the universe for reasons of its own. And that explains the title of the paper, Disturbing Implications. <laughs> because as atheist theoretical physicists, they said, if dark energy is real, then we're stuck with an agent beyond space and time that's performing miracles for reasons of his own. And therefore, they concluded this paper, 21-page paper, with this last sentence. Perhaps the only reasonable conclusion is we do not live in a world with a true cosmological constant. In other words, they concluded this paper by saying, dark energy must be wrong, because if it's real, then we're stuck with an agent beyond space and time, performing miracles for reasons of his own. Now, the irony of this paper is it was published 
just five to seven months before, astronomers developed nine independent observational demonstrations that not only is dark energy real, it's the dominant component of the universe. And if you're interested in what those nine are, here's a list. Uh, I'm not going to go into the technical details. If you're interested, I've written an article on every one of these nine uh, observational demonstrations. You can find them on our website. In fact, here is the URL where you'll find those articles. And uh, you can see for yourself the demonstration that indeed dark energy not only is real, but is a dominant component of the universe. And by the way, these are the nine that were measured and discovered uh, within seven months after this paper was published. The list now stands at 25. And if you go to that URL, you'll see all 25 described with uh, citations to the literature. But dark energy is not the only compelling evidence that the God of the Bible designed the entire universe for the benefit of life and human beings in particular. It simply ranks as the most spectacular measurable evidence for supernatural, superintelligent design. But the truth is virtually every feature of the universe that we measure shows this very high level of fine-tuning design. So for example, all the laws of physics or the forces of physics have to be fine-tuned. I mean, if you were to disturb the ratio of the gravitational force to the electromagnetic force by as little as one part in 10,000 trillion, 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 there'd be no stars. Stars would either never form or they would form and instantly explode. Either way, no possibility for life. And hey, the list goes on. It's crucial that the number of protons in the universe equal the number of electrons in the universe uh, to better than one part in 10 trillion, trillion, trillion times, or life is not going to be possible. You know, say, what does that C stand for? Carbon-based life. That's the only assumption. I don't care how many eyes the creature has. The only assumption we bring to bear here is that life must be built on carbon. And that was settled 35 years ago. 35 years ago, there was speculation. Maybe we can make life on boron or silicon or arsenic. But we now know only carbon has the bonding stability and bonding complexity to make life possible. Now, if this is really evidence for the supernatural personal handiwork of the creator in space and time, we would expect this list to grow as we measure more and more of the universe in greater and greater detail. And so we began a project at Reasons to Believe back in 1991. In fact, I spoke here about that time back in those days. 1991, 17 known features that show this high level of fine-tuning design. But see how the list has grown as we scientists have measured more and more of the universe. The list now stands way over 180 different features of the laws of physics and the features of the universe that must be fine-tuned to make life possible. But hey, if you want a one-sentence summary, you'll find it in Hebrews 1.10. The heavens are the work of your hands. Now, if you were to go to any bookstore, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, an academic type bookstore, you will find dozens of books that make this point. And almost all of those books are written by unbelievers. So for example, Paul Davies wrote a book called The Cosmic Blueprint, in which he said, everywhere we look in the universe, we see this overwhelming evidence for design. It's called the Anthropic Principle. And I've counted over 50 books that have been written documenting this evidence for this incredible fine-tuning design in the universe to make life possible. But that's typically where the books stop. And one thing I've found with my astronomy peers, they say, well, if we see design at the level of the universe, I can live with that. What they can't live with is if the design actually gets close to home. And this is what's been overlooked in a lot of these published books, is the fact that we not only see this extremely high level of fine-tuning design on the size scale of the entire universe, we see it on all size scales, which means that God is personally involved, not just in the universe as a whole, but all the way down even to the individual fundamental particles, and certainly that would apply to every human being. So for example, 
we now realize it's not just that we need a special universe. Life is not possible unless you've got the just right cluster of galaxies. And it's not possible unless you've got a just right galaxy. In fact, you can go to our website, over 200 different features of our Milky Way galaxy must be fine-tuned design in order to make advanced life possible here on planet Earth. You know, that made it difficult for me to watch Star Wars because the thing opens up with a galaxy far, far away. Well, we've looked far, far away. We don't see any galaxies that could be possible candidates for advanced life. And we need a just right star. And now we've found literally more than 1,800 planets outside of the solar system. First one was discovered in 1995. <clears throat> and I remember back then my peers were saying, we're going to find hundreds of planets just like the planets in our solar system. Well, the truth is, even with 1,800 planets now discovered and measured, not only do we not find any like the Earth, we don't find any like any of our solar system planets. We're not finding a Venus twin, a Jupiter twin, a Neptune twin. And so what this has shown us, something we didn't know until we discovered these planets inside of the solar system, is literally every single planet in our solar system plays a critical role in making advanced life possible here on planet Earth. So I don't know about your family, but come November and Thanksgiving Day, we're going to sit down, we're going to thank God for Mercury, for Venus, for Mars, for <laughs> Neptune, for Uranus. And I'm going to bore my sons by explaining to them why they all have to be exactly the way they are so that we can enjoy our Thanksgiving dinner. And you can actually go to our website. I've written articles on this about why every single planet counts in making life possible. And of course, we need to just write Earth. And over 20 different features of the moon had to be fine-tuned in order to make life possible. <coughs> now, this is opening up the possibility for testing. Remember I started off by saying you have all these atheist scientists saying creation is not testable? Well, it's difficult to make a test if your sample size is one. That's the problem with the universe as a whole. But if we're talking stars and galaxies and planets, we now have a database in the billions. And so, we can actually come up with some ways of testing, say, a non-theistic worldview with a biblical worldview. So if there is no creator responsible for these features, we would expect that the design of our galaxy and solar system, for example, to make life possible would decrease in both the degree of fine-tuning and the number of features showing this fine-tuning as we learn more about our galaxy and solar system. And consequently, we anticipate that the evidence for the biblical God as a designer would get progressively weaker and weaker as we learn more and more. However, if we're talking the God of the Bible, we predict the exact opposite, that the evidence would increase in terms of the degree of fine-tuning and the number of features that show that fine-tuning, and hence that the evidence for the biblical God would get stronger. And so back in 1995, we launched a research project surveying the scientific literature and saying, let's actually measure the number of features and the degree of fine-tuning. And back then, we could identify 41 different features that required this fine-tuning design. And I took a course from Carl Sagan when I was at the University of Toronto, and he spoke about the universe containing 100 billion trillion planets. A bit optimistic, but taking that number and determining the dependency factors amongst these different features, we calculated there was less than one chance in 10 to the 31st power that we would find any body in the entire observable universe that would have the capacity to support life without invoking miracles. Now that was 1995. This is how the evidence has increased with respect to time. So. At the end of 2006, 676 features, not just 41, have been discovered required this fine-tuning design. And by the way, this is not a calculation for human beings. This is what you need just to have bacteria living on a planet for a long period of time. And the probability is less than one chance in 10 to the 556th power. Now, 
If you actually look at this last column, what it is showing us is that the evidence that a personal God beyond space and time has designed our galaxy and our solar system so that life can exist on one body is getting stronger by a factor of a million per month. So every month that goes by, the evidence gets a million times stronger. So when I'm speaking on this in a university audience, I'll say, if you're not convinced today, wait one month. <laughs> and if the evidence gets that dramatically stronger, then you need to seriously consider the claims that are made in your life in the pages of the Bible. And Freeman Dyson, he wrote a book called Disturbing Universe. He's on television all the time, famous theoretical physicist and astronomer, identifies himself at times as an atheist, other times as an agnostic, but this is what he wrote in his book. The more I examine the universe, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. In other words, it was designed in advance for human beings. In fact, I'm writing a book right now where I make the point that over the past 13.8 billion years of the history of the universe, we can see how God has stepped in every step of the way to get things ready for human beings at the best possible time and the best possible place. Now, I imagine most of you in this audience are already committed followers of Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, you know, this goes down well when you're speaking in front of a Christian audience. But I've given this kind of message frequently in front of university audiences. In fact, one time I was invited to address the International Skeptic Society Conference. So with 700 atheists from all over the world, <laughs> most of them with advanced degrees in engineering and science, and it was a whole weekend conference where they had these uh, famous scientists from around the world trying to give a case for why there is no God. At the very end, they had me come up and debate Victor Stenger, a particle physicist. And uh, they recorded the whole thing. And this is what it's called. That's not our title. That's the title the uh, Skeptic Society put on it, The Great Debate. And um, they sell it for $30. We have it out there for five. We want you to see how this evidence stands up in a very hostile, well-educated audience. And you won't believe what Victor Stenger said at the very end. They gave him the last word, but I was stunned by what he said right at the very end of that debate. And uh, if you want to read something in more detail, why the universe is the way it is, by the way, that's at a very lay level. Uh, much lower than what you've been hearing uh, this morning, so uh, you can get that. And if you want to engage us, uh, all of us scholars are on Facebook and uh, Twitter, and you can get that on our site as well, and uh, we're here to answer questions that you might have about this. Uh, but let me close with uh, this statement from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And so here again is a one-sentence summary. It's not just the universe that has been designed by God. Everything on the earth, Psalm 104, literally every life form that God has created, past and present, was put into place in order to serve and please us human beings. And I got a couple of minutes left, so let me just add one little bonus feature. This is something just recently discovered that we human beings are living at a unique time in cosmic history. Thanks to our ability to observe the radiation from the cosmic creation event. This is an image of the universe right at the beginning of the universe. Say, how close can you get? When you measure the polarization of that uh, uh, light that you see there, you're actually seeing the universe when it's one one hundred billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. That's how close we can get to the cosmic creation event. But it's our ability to observe that now shows us that if we were created any earlier in the history of the universe, light from the cosmic creation event would not have adequate time to travel along the surface of the universe and reach our telescope. But because of dark energy, if we were put here any later, light from the cosmic creation event would speed past us. We're living at the only time in the history of the universe where we can actually observe 100% of the history of the universe right back to the cosmic creation event. And this is where we get the most compelling evidence that a God beyond space and time, scientific evidence, 
must have created everything. Now, I've shared that in front of astronomers and physicists on university campuses, and those that are atheists and agnostics say, oh, that's just a coincidence that we happen to be here at the one time where we could watch everything. Well, let me also add this. It's not just that we're living at a unique time. We're living in a unique location. This is where our sun is in the Milky Way galaxy. And notice how far away we are from the galactic bulge, where 50% of the stars are. If we were any closer to that galactic bulge, the night sky would be too bright for us to see the faint energy from the cosmic creation event. The other thing that we notice is that we're right now halfway between two spiral arms. And this, again, gives us a night sky dark enough that we can see the entire scope of the universe. And we're also distant from gaseous nebulae, these little pink spots that you see here. And it's not just that we're in the right spot in our galaxy. Our galaxy is in the right spot of the universe. This is a typical cluster of galaxies, where you've got supergiant galaxies jammed very tightly together. What if we were on this spiral galaxy over here with a telescope? All you would see was light from these neighboring galaxies. We happen to be living in the one cluster of galaxies where the galaxies are far apart and there's only 100 member galaxies. Most galaxies live in clusters where there's 10,000 plus members all jammed tightly together. And so we're not only living at a unique time in the history of the universe, we're living in the one location in this universe of 50 billion trillion stars where we get a clear view. Now, God wanted you to be able to read the entire book of Scripture. He gave you 66 books written by 39 different authors. But he also wanted us to have the ability to witness the entire scope of the book of nature. The heavens declare the glory of God. God made sure that he placed his human beings at that right time and right location. So thank you, and feel free to pick up your free copy of this DVD. <laughs>